a guide to growing sweet potatoes. This root vegetable is much sweeter than a regular potato, hence its name. They're also quite nutritious and good for the immune system as they're high in vitamin A, along with other vitamins and minerals. Sweet potatoes are delicious in soups, when roasted and when baked with spices. Sweet potatoes versus yams. Sweet potatoes are also sometimes confused with yams. True yams are rarely found in American grocery stores and are starchy, dry tubers from Africa. They have a cylindrical shape with blackish or brown, bark-like skin and white, purple, or reddish flesh. Yams are often found in specialty stores. In American grocery stores, there will typically be two different types of sweet potatoes, firm and soft. These stores will often call the firm type a sweet potato and the soft type a yam to differentiate the two, even though neither is a true yam. To add more to the confusion, it's the soft sweet potato with the deep orange flesh and copper skin that is usually planted and eaten, even if stores call it a yam. Carefully look at the flesh and skin to confirm which is which. Sweet potato varieties. Beauregard. This variety takes 100 days to harvest and has light purple skin with a dark orange flesh. It was developed at Louisiana State University in 1987 and is an extremely high yielding variety. O. Henry and White Yam. A variety with a white cream colored flesh and skin. These are both high yielding sweet potatoes with good flavor. White yam produces smaller tapered roots, while O. Henry produces larger roots with a shape similar to Beauregard. Carolina Ruby. This type has deep orange flesh and garnet colored skin with an unusually rough texture. It produces moderate yields. Bush Puerto Rico. A variety with compact vines, copper skin, and orange flesh. It takes 110 days to mature and produces a heavy yield. Centennial. With orange skin and flesh, this variety is resistant to internal cork and wilt, takes 100 days to mature, and keeps well in storage. Georgia Jet. A red-skinned variety with orange flesh. It's somewhat tolerant to cold and takes 100 days to mature. Jewel. This variety has orange flesh, yields well, and takes 100 days to mature. It also keeps extremely well in storage. Sumer. A variety with ivory to very light yellow flesh and may be substituted for Irish potatoes in very warm regions. Patriot. This variety is known for its copper skin and orange flesh. The Patriot's great pest resistance makes it a popular choice for organic gardens. Vardaman. A compact bush type. This variety has golden skin, orange flesh, and its young leaves are purple. Typically, it takes a bit longer to mature than other varieties at about 110 days. Technically, sweet potatoes aren't started by seeds, but rather by slips, which are shoots from a mature sweet potato. Slips can be started by taking a disease-free, fully grown sweet potato from last year's crop or the supermarket. First, it should be washed to remove any anti-sprouting chemicals that a grocery store might have applied. Next, suspend a healthy root with the pointed end facing up with toothpicks in a glass of water. In a few weeks, there should be new growth. Change this water routinely, as it will turn foul after about a week. The sweet potato root will sprout slips after a couple weeks and will look like green shoots with exposed roots. When they're three inches or more, these slips can either be planted directly in the field or planted in a pot to start a transplant. For best results, the soil in its pot should be at least 65 degrees Fahrenheit. It's important to note that sweet potatoes are storage roots, not tubers. 
so new shoots will emerge along the entire root, and one sweet potato should yield about 12 plants. The process from bedding to planting takes about six weeks, so here are some tips for homegrown sweet potatoes. Buy certified seed stock at a garden center or preferred varieties from a market. Cover the bottom of an eight inch deep container or box with two to three inches of sand or soilless growing mix and make sure the container has drainage holes. Slice the roots lengthwise and place them with their cut side down in the container. Then cover with two to four inches of sand or growing mix. Keep the roots moist and warm, 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, and keep them covered with plastic until the plants emerge. Once they've emerged, the plastic can be removed. Now plants can be grown directly under cool white fluorescent tubes for 14 to 16 hours a day. Next, pull slips from the bedded roots and plant them after the danger of frost has completely passed. Slips are rootless when pulled from the mother root, so they need to be kept well watered. Sweet potatoes' ideal soil pH is between 5.5 to 6.5, while their preferred soil temperature is between 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, their minimum air temperature is between 65 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Sweet potatoes prefer light, sandy soils, but will grow well in heavier soils that are high in clay content. Set the plants 12 to 18 inches apart in the row. Then gently firm the soil around each one. Water the plants immediately to establish good soil to root contact. And it's also possible to water them using a starter solution. One to two tablespoons of a 12 to 12 to 12 fertilizer per gallon of water. Weeding. Start weeding sweet potato beds about two weeks after planting to keep weeds down. Remember to reshape the beds with soil or mulch afterward. And it's also beneficial to avoid deep digging with a hoe or other tools that could disturb the feeder roots of the sweet potato plants. Watering. Remember to keep the plants watered weekly, especially during midsummer. Deep watering in hot, dry periods will help to increase yields. But if the plan was to store some of these potatoes, don't give the plants any extra water late in the season because it can cause the tuber's skin to crack. Pruning. For good harvests, don't prune the vines because they should be quite vigorous. Mounding. When the above ground portion of the plant is about 12 inches, 30 centimeters tall, hill up the soil about six inches, 15 centimeters around the plants. It's okay to cover green leaves, so don't worry if this happens. Straw or grass mulch also works well in this process, which can be repeated up to two or three times. Fertilizer. Go easy on the nitrogen fertilizer, since too much will produce beautiful vines, but few roots. Side dress sweet potato plants three to four weeks after transplanting with three pounds of five to 10 to 10 fertilizer per 100 feet of row. When working with sandy soil, use five pounds of the fertilizer. As well, side dress with nitrogen or three tablespoons of a 10 to 10 to 10 fertilizer per 10 feet doing so once or twice during the growing season. Mulch. Sweet potatoes respond well to ground warming black plastic mulch. Simply lay a sheet of plastic tight against the soil, then plant the slips into holes that are cut in the plastic. It's possible to produce good yields without using plastic mulch. But the warming mulch will extend the growing season by a few weeks, which can increase yields dramatically. Any sweet potato slips that are grown indoors need to be hardened off first before transplanting. Gradually expose them to the strong summer sun over a period of one to two weeks a task that can easily be done by placing the mother plants in warm filtered shade. 
companion plants do's and don'ts. As a rule of thumb, root vegetables like parsnips and beets are good companions for sweet potatoes. As well, dill, thyme, and corn are other great companions. Squash is something that shouldn't be grown with sweet potatoes. Growing structure options. Raised beds. Raised beds should be used in a sunny spot with loamy, well-drained soil. Sweet potatoes aren't too picky, but they do prefer soil on the sandier side. They also need plenty of air space in the soil for their roots to reach down. If the soil is clay, rocky, or compacted, consider using raised beds to grow sweet potatoes. Things to keep in mind. It's important to pick a spot with plenty of room for sweet potato vines to run. About three feet between rows should do the trick. When growing sweet potatoes in the northern U.S. or in Canada, consider covering the growing area with fabric mulch about three weeks before planting. This helps to warm the soil, which the sweet potatoes will love. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations, but if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days, or about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects, like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Sweet Potato Stem Borers These larvae will bury into the stem that leads to a plant's storage roots. Sweet potato stem borers will feed on the crown region, which then causes plants to wilt, yellow, and then die. Here's what to do. Keep fields free from weeds, especially Ipomoea weeds. Also, try fallowing the land for a few seasons, aka taking a break from planting, if the infestation is too severe. As well, use insect-free planting material and pheromone traps to monitor and control these pesky borers. Sweet Potato Weevils This is the main pest that affects sweet potatoes. Weevils can't dig. So they get to the roots of a sweet potato plant through cracks in the soil when that soil dries out. Weevils might also follow a vine down into the soil and move along the root system until they come across a storage root to eat. Here's what to do. Hilling up the soil around the base of plants and on the sides of the ridges can help prevent or fill soil cracks. When conditions are dry and the soil cracks, Sweet potato weevil damage can become a serious problem since the weevils can more easily reach the roots of the sweet potato. 
Also, be sure to practice good field sanitation by carefully removing and destroying, either by burning or feeding to livestock, all old vines or root residues that may be left in the garden. This process can help break the sweet potato weevil's life cycle. It's also important to use clean, uninfected shoots and slips when starting sweet potatoes. Weevils tend to lay their eggs in the older, woodier parts of the vine, so cuttings should only be taken from the healthy-looking plants. As well, allowing predatory natural enemies, like ants, earwigs, ground beetles, and spiders to move through sweet potato fields can help keep weevil numbers under control. Ant nests can even be moved closer to the sweet potato patch. Finally, using a barrier crop, like cassava, maize, bananas, or sorghum, in strips that are at least three to five meters wide between any old and new sweet potato fields can help, since it reduces the number of weevils that might be migrating to the newly planted crop. White flies. These pests are known for their white bodies and wings, and for hanging out on the undersides of leaves. They feed on the leaves of a plant, causing damage that makes the plant susceptible to other diseases. These pesky flies will typically group together on the undersides of leaves, and then the flies will fly up when disturbed. Here's what to do. Remove any affected leaves, or the whole plant, if it's severely infested. Introduce beneficial insects, like ladybugs, spiders, lacewing larvae, and dragonflies into the garden. Use yellow sticky traps, and apply insecticidal soaps or oils. Keep in mind that these oils, like neem oil, might reduce white fly numbers, but they won't eliminate them entirely. White grubs. This pest feeds on the underground parts of a plant, including the main stem and roots, and also feed on the tubers by making tunnels. This will wilt the plant, and eventually the plant will die. Here's what to do. Practice deep summer ploughing to expose any grubs that may be present in the soil, while also making sure soil has good drainage. As well, follow crop rotation with soybeans to reduce these grub populations. Finally, there are some safe bacteria that can be introduced into a garden to kill off these white grubs. Potential diseases and their solutions. Alternaria leaf blight. This fungus loves warm and wet conditions, causing brown spots with yellow edges to appear on the leaves, usually the oldest leaves first of a crop. The center of these lesions will also develop gray to brown soft fungal mold, eventually drying out and giving leaves a shot hole appearance. As the disease progresses, leaves will begin to curl and eventually will die and drop from the plant. This disease is common in growing areas with high temperatures and frequent rainfall. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease-resistant seeds when possible, and water plants from below to avoid having soil splash up onto the lower leaves of the plants. It's also helpful to water plants in the morning so that they have time to dry out during the day. In addition to watering plants from below, it's also helpful to provide a well-ventilated cover for the plants to protect the plants from rain. Be sure to clean any equipment between uses to prevent the spread of bacteria. And do not prune or handle plants when those plants are wet. As well, establish a crop rotation and stick to it. If there are any blighty leaves present, usually on the bottom of the plant closest to the soil, remove and destroy them. Finally, plant leaves can be sprayed with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and one teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water, or neem oil. Just take care not to use neem oil when pollinating insects, like bees or other beneficial insects are present. Spray only a few leaves to start, then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Black rot. 
a soil or seed-borne bacteria that causes distinct lesions to form around the outsides of leaves. These lesions turn yellow slash orange and travel inward on the infected leaves, typically in a V shape. As well, these lesions might come together and give plants a scorched appearance. Leaf veins will then turn dark, and the stems of the plant might become discolored as well, with some dark rings on them. Leaves might wilt, dry out, and drop, and plants can eventually die. Black rot can happen at any stage of the growth process, and can be spread by splashing water, equipment, wind, people, or insects. The disease typically emerges in moist, warm conditions. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free seeds or resistant varieties when possible. But before planting, soak the seeds in 122 degree Fahrenheit water for about 25 minutes to kill any lingering bacteria. Keep in mind that soaking seeds this way isn't 100% effective against black rot and might actually lower the seed's germination rate. As well, practice a two-year crop rotation and only use clean, sanitized tools near any crops. Wash tools with a diluted bleach mixture, about one part bleach to 10 parts water. Then rinse with cool water and towel dry after each use. It's important to control the growth of weeds and to follow the recommended plant spacing to increase airflow around plants while also allowing plants to dry their leaves quicker. Be sure to remove and destroy any infected plants and avoid overhead watering. Fusarium root and stem rot. This disease causes the stems of a plant to swell and become distorted at the base of the plant. Any affected areas will begin to wilt and turn brown, and eventually these areas will dry out and harden. As well, deep, Dark rot will grow into the tuber and form cavities, while there's also a growth of white mold. Typically, this disease is spread by infected transplants. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free roots, or use cut transplants rather than slips. As well, practice crop rotation and treat seed roots with an appropriate fungicide before planting the roots into the garden. Keep the garden free of any plant debris, destroy any infected plants, and avoid overhead watering. It also helps to improve the air circulation around the plants. Leaf and Stem Scab Small brown lesions will grow on the leaf veins, and those lesions will then become corky in texture, causing the veins to shrink and the leaves to curl. Lesions on the stem are slightly raised and have purple to brown centers with light brown edges. As well, scabby lesions will form on the stems when all of the smaller lesions come together. Here's what to do. Avoid overhead watering and practice good crop rotation. As well, use only disease-free cuttings or slips and destroy any crop residue immediately after the harvest. Certain fungicides can also help to control this disease. Sweet Potato Virus Disease, SPVD. This is a disease that's caused by two viruses, Sweet Potato Chlorotic Stunt Virus, SPCSV, and Sweet Potato Feathery Model Virus, SPFMV. This resulting SPVD causes the severe stunting of infected plants and distorted discoloration on the leaves. There might also be some feathery purple patterns on the affected leaves. Here's what to do. Use healthy cuttings for planting and practice good crop rotation. Control any aphid or white fly populations too, since these pests spread the disease. Finally, be sure to remove and burn any infected plants. Harvesting. Sweet potatoes generally mature in 85 to 120 days, and it helps to check their root size after 80 to 85 days. For best quality, harvest the tubers when they reach about 5 to 6 inches in length and about 2 inches in diameter. 
Harvest the roots as soon as they reach eating size and before any frost is set to arrive. Digging up sweet potatoes will be much easier when their vines are cut off first. Then use a garden fork or spade to loosen the soil and gently lift up and expose the sweet potatoes. Handle them with care, gently removing any attached soil clumps. Don't rub the skin or wash the roots before storing them inside. And if the weather is dry, they should sit on the ground for several hours before bringing them in. Note, if the vines are exposed to frost, dig the roots up immediately because any decay in dead vines will pass down to the roots. If that's not possible, then cut away the vines and throw some loose soil over the rows to protect them from the cold. Temperatures below 55 degrees Fahrenheit can cause chilling injury. Sweet potatoes should yield 20 to 40 pounds for each 10 foot of row. Storage. To cure sweet potatoes for storage, they'll need a temperature between 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 to 32 degrees Celsius, plus high humidity for five to 10 days. Once cured, sweet potatoes should be stored at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit in a spot with high humidity. Under these conditions, some varieties can be stored for up to a year. Their sugar content will slowly increase in storage, but roots will shrivel and sprout if temperatures are too high, so keep that in mind. As well, roots will usually store successfully even without the one-week curing process.